I'm hoping that we're going right now and that we have a full group in that has been entered in. And we're very happy to have everybody joining in today. My name is Jeff Spofford. I am past president of the Worcester County Bar Association. I am also the chair of the ad hoc committee for attorney well-being in Worcester County. And we're thrilled to have this committee uh, working now on well-being week in the law. Uh, I want to say first, when, when we get into well-being week in the law in Worcester County and everywhere in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we have to thank Heidi Alexander, who is the director of the SJC's Standing Committee on Attorney Well-Being. Uh, Heidi brings a passion uh, to helping lawyers in need and helping address uh, issues related to the well-being of lawyers. Uh, and then before I go even any farther, uh, a shout out to Amanda Rowan, who is one of the co-chairs of the SJC Standing Committee on Attorney Wellbeing. The program that she uh, moderated yesterday, if you had any chance to see it uh, yesterday evening called Recovering Out Loud, uh, was just tremendous. And it was the talk about issues relating to addiction, relating to recovery, uh, which need to be done and need to be had. It's the same thing as talks about uh, mental health and how we talk about our illnesses, how we talk about our injuries. It's the same type of thing. It's mental health, it's physical health, and we need to destigmatize destigmatize those subjects. Uh, and I had a chance with Amanda uh, to be one of the uh, writers of, of articles in Lawyers Weekly to talk about different issues whether it's substance abuse and recovery. For me, it was my own recovery from mental health struggles and depression and anxiety and how that affected me. And I was happy to open up about it. And I think we all need to be prepared to talk about those subjects. So today, the Worcester County Bar Association is working together with Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers uh, to co-host a program, the presentation on Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers. It's a resource for lawyers that are in crisis with addiction, whether it's alcohol or drugs. We know that it's been around since the 1970s. Uh, and we know from the NORC report how high the percentage is of lawyers in need of assistance. 42% of lawyers in the NORC report said they have issues with the abuse of alcohol, yet only 2% of the lawyers say that they are getting help. Lawyers concerned for lawyers is there, has been there, but it also offers far more. And we're hoping today that people that are joining in on this presentation will get to know the breadth of the Lawyers Concern for Lawyers offerings. There will be time for question and answer, and we ask that you put your questions in the chat function. Um, and you can do it anonymously if you wish. We're happy to have the questions asked. Amy Levine is on with us, and she'll be doing the question and answer. So, Today's presentation on Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers uh, will, have, will involve psychologist Dr. Jeff Fortang and attorney Jane Lavoie, and they'll discuss the mission of Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers and the free and confidential services that it offers to law students, to lawyers, to judges, and others in the legal profession across Massachusetts. The presentation will provide a brief overview of the recent uh, report on lawyer well-being in Massachusetts. It'll look at the barriers that hold lawyers back from asking for help and discuss lawyers' concern for lawyers' services in the areas of ethics and practice management, mental health, addiction recovery, and well-being. Let me introduce your two speakers. I'm going to introduce them both, and then I'm going to turn it over to them, and they're going to run the program, uh, and I hope you'll find it very informative. Dr. Jeffrey Fortang, PhD, LADC, is a licensed psychologist and licensed alcohol and drug counselor. He's a former clinical instructor in psychology at Harvard Medical School. His career has included working in and directing both inpatient and outpatient programs in the greater Boston area. Dr. Fortang has become well acquainted with the lives and stresses of lawyers through his LCL staff position since 1998. Dr. Fortang provides clinical consultations to lawyers and runs online groups for solo practitioners and immigration lawyers dealing with professional stress. He also maintains a half-time practice in Newton and via telehealth. He is a co-author with LCL colleague, Sean Healy, of the ABA published book, The Full Weight of the Law, How Legal Professionals Can Recognize and Rebound from Depression. Joining Dr. Fortang will be Jane Lavoie. Jane Lavoie 
joined LCL in 2022 as a senior law practice advi advisor, a role that requires her to meet regularly with clients, develop programs, write articles, make presentations to the legal community, as well as act as a mentor. Jane has over 30 years of legal experience, including work in large and mid-sized firms and in solo practice. Jane also served as Assistant General Counsel to the Board of Bar Overseers and Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, and as a hearing officer for the Mass Bureau of Special Education Appeals. Prior to law school, Jane worked as a family service officer at the Suffolk Probate Court and as a social worker at what is now the Mass Department of Children and Families. Jane's a graduate of Boston College, summa cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa, and Yale Law School. She's an avid reader and in her spare time enjoys skiing, sailing, swimming, hiking, and art. I'll pass it over to Dr. Fortang at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm Jeff Fortang is how it's actually pronounced, but uh, all through my youth, Fortang was my nickname because uh, every year uh, when the school year began and the teachers read the names, they always said Fortang. Somehow what one is blind to the first G. So um, let me, uh, this is the first time Jane and I have co-presented and we hope to succeed in giving you an overview of what LCL does and the kinds of issues that we address, which, which certainly are much broader than only alcohol and, and drug issues, although that was the original genesis of LCL. So now let me attempt to share my screen. And slides. You all see, all see my opening slide there? Great. So this is who we are and, and uh, self-explanatory. So let's talk about some kinds of stresses that lawyers do face. It, it's a particularly stressful occupation. Uh, some of the sources are dealing with the fact that, that it's not only a professional endeavor, but it's a business. Uh, maintaining a professional identity alongside one's genuine self and relationships. Uh, needing income, this is uh, something that, that's, that comes up a lot for the lawyers. We see especially the younger ones who these days are coming out of law school with gigantic student loans. Um, it is the only profession in which you can be licensed and start functioning without having been uh, required to have an apprenticeship. Uh, as a psychologist, for example, I needed two years of full-time supervised clinical experience before I could be licensed. And so that means that there's, there's less guidance than in other professions. Uh, you're dealing with uh, client expectations and those pressures. In firms and agencies, you're dealing with the stresses related to relationships and politics. And uh, these days, what I hear about more and more in some of the groups I run is uh, issues of uh, aggressiveness and incivility that uh, the, the lawyers whom I see, who are all very nice, uh, have to deal with. Uh, in addition, in, in the last few years, like everyone else, lawyers have been affected by the impact of COVID uh, and the climate and, and the political environment that we're all dealing with. And we've seen increases in, uh, in mental health symptoms related to that. So uh, let's talk about lawyer culture, uh, which has come down to us through many years. Um, the lawyer uh, is seen and sees themselves typically as a problem solver who's in control of things. The lawyer tends to ignore their own needs. They're focused on the client. They traditionally tend not to ask for help and to uh, present an invulnerable veneer. Now, people in general can be slow to ask for help. But uh, we see this problem more so in professions where people have this image to maintain, including lawyers and doctors. Younger lawyers and law students, I think, are a little less limited uh, in this way and feel a little more okay about it. 
lawyers, for the most part, operate within an adversarial system uh, that fits the term zero-sum game, meaning that there are two sides, and the more that I win, the more that you lose. And this creates its own kinds of stress. Uh, I sometimes compare that to the profession of teaching, for example, where uh, if I'm the teacher and you're the student and you learn a lot, then we, we, we're both successful at the same time. Um, in lawyer culture, in many parts of it, overwork is considered normal. And we also see that the adoption of these uh, ways of thinking and picturing oneself in the world uh, and the symptoms that go with it begin in law school. There are a, a number of studies that have shown that. So this slide is about the prevalence of various kinds of mental health issues uh, in lawyers compared to the general population. As you can see in, in depression, the, the figures vary greatly as to the prevalence of depression. And this has to do partly with how one defines it, but also the 19% the figure, and the, those asterisks were meant to uh, refer to the, the, the uh, dots on the bottom, the, the Microsoft changed the asterisks to dots. Um, uh, the 19% the figure was obtained uh, after the pandemic began and all kinds of symptoms have been greater since the pandemic began. Uh, there, this uh, shows two major studies of lawyers that were both survey studies. One was done by the ABA uh, about five or six years ago, found a depression rate of about 28%. And the recent study of Massachusetts lawyers by a group called NORC uh, found it at 21%, either way, at least somewhat higher than the general population. Anxiety. Uh, the ABA study found about the same level in lawyers uh, as uh, the general population. The Massachusetts study found a considerably higher level of anxiety, but again, that study was done after the onset of COVID. Uh, alcohol problems, many, many studies of different types all find the same thing, which is that lawyers have a much higher incidence uh, in the general population, it's about 6%. Uh, in the ABA study from five or six years ago, it was 21%. And in the Massachusetts study, they came up with 42%, which is a very high figure and is partly because they were, uh, in my view, lumping in heavy drinkers or what used to be called problem drinkers with what used to be called alcoholics. And um, so, uh, essentially, they're including everyone who reported that uh, recurrently they have more than three or four drinks in a day. Uh, in terms of burnout, 77% uh, uh, reported burnout, yet 66% reported overall satisfaction. And increased burnout and depression were seen in marginalized group and those working in unsupportive settings. Um, let's move on to the issue of seeking help. Uh, the NORC study suggested that about 53% of people sought help for depression and anxiety, a very small percent for alcohol. Uh, uh, again, many of the people who were considered to have alcohol problems undoubtedly did not see themselves as having alcohol problems and tended to be young, high earners, uh, not all of whom had what we used to call the disease of alcoholism. In addition, there's always uh, across studies a concern about stigma and professional image that gets in the way of lawyers seeking help. And for the last several years, there's also been a difficulty uh, finding help uh, from finding enough providers. There's a shortage of providers right now. Um, I, I see that Heidi has her hand up, uh, and I don't know if that means, I guess you'd like to make a comment now, Heidi? 
Um, so let's look at the contented, healthy, and effective lawyer uh, who is coping with stress, is not swallowed by lawyer culture, has self-awareness, and uh, lawyers, many lawyers uh, tend to be much more aware of their clients' needs than their own, and is taking good care of themselves professionally. I'm just going to do a quick overview of some of the kinds of issues that uh, we address at Lawyers Concern for Lawyers. So anger, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> anxiety include, I'm looking at Al Pacino in the movie and, uh, and Justice for All, in which he gets very angry. But um, uh, I won't bother reading through all these symptoms, but some of the disorders are generalized anxiety in which a person is anxious much of the time and, and worried. Uh, agoraphobia, which, in which people uh, restrict where they, how far they feel they can go from home and, and feel safe. And I, I ran into some cases of people who began isolating during COVID who kind of developed a more agoraphobic picture. Um, social phobia, where people are very uncomfortable in social situations. Panic disorder, which means a person has recurrent panic attacks, which are essentially having the symptoms that you might have if, you, if your foot was stuck on the track and the train was coming. Um, but in situations that don't warrant it. Uh, depression, uh, some of the key symptoms uh, include affecting energy, sleep, uh, pessimism, concentration, uh, decreased self-worth. Um, and burnout looks quite similar to depression, but tends to be specific to work content context. Uh, and it typically has a gradual onset. So um, people who have burnout might look quite depressed and when they're on vacation, <clears throat> the symptom picture might improve significantly. And that's one of the ways you can sort out depression from burnout. Then of course there's alcohol use disorder um, and some of the key symptoms of that and key diagnostic features are the ones that I put in bold face here the inability to consistently regulate the amount consumed and continued use despite repeated negative consequences. Um, the consequences can be legal, physical, in relationships, uh, mood, uh, risky behavior, et cetera. And that's one of the ways that we know that addiction is not volitional behavior, that people can't simply decide to change that behavior. Because if, if it were, uh, regular behavior and it repeatedly caused negative consequences, people would adjust their behavior. Uh, not everyone with an addiction or especially with alcohol has withdrawal symptoms. That can be part of the picture. And uh, many times they've made their own efforts to regulate their drinking or drugging and it doesn't work. With lawyers, alcohol by far is the most popular substance. Finally, we uh, sometimes find ourselves dealing with vicarious traumatization, um, especially with lawyers who, who deal with um, uh, upsetting uh, family law kinds of things or with domestic abuse and, and immigration lawyers. Where um, with regular post-traumatic stress disorder, one is experiencing or witnessing firsthand an event. In this case, you're kind of witnessing it secondhand from your client. Uh, and the, uh, the next thing that is involved in this diagnosis is it has an effect on mood, uh, including fear, anger, and, and kind of being numbed or detached. And so, so there are certainly are people that have all three of those features. There's a re-experiencing of the event that in this case, the event that you've heard your client speak of or and, and experience their emotions as they speak of it and reacting to cues in the environment that are reminiscent of it. That can lead to avoidance. Uh, I've talked with lawyers who avoid uh, books and movies and uh, other activities 
that contain stimuli related to the traumatic experiences that they've heard about. And finally, uh, there are arousal symptoms that include insomnia, irritability, and vigilance. So all of these are also symptoms of PTSD, but in this case, it's kind of once removed and generally less severe. Still, when lawyers experience this, it's very important for them to look at ways to balance their, their life so that they're not overwhelmed with all of this. So I'm going to stop my share now and turn it over to Jane and attempt to share her slides. Okay, Jane. Thanks, Jeff. Hi, everyone. I'm Jane Lavoy, and I'm a senior law practice management advisor at LCL, and I also oversee our recovery services. So this is just my first slide. It's just about the services we offer. And I don't know that everyone is always aware of the variety of services LCL provides. So we offer practice management and ethics advice, recovery, mental health, and well-being services. Jeff has talked about the mental health and well-being, so I'm focusing on the practice management, ethics, and recovery. Okay, Jeff. Jeff is moving my slides because we, when we couldn't quite get them to work. Okay, so there are multiple ways to connect with us. This is just a very simple slide. It's um, we have a website that's lclma.org, and we have a recently launched uh, online community, which is connect.lclma.org. We also have a phone number. So there are multiple ways to reach us and find our resources. Yeah. Okay, so this is a look at our website. So as it shows, we provide services to judges and courts, bar associations, law students, law schools, legal employers, family members. So anyone that's connected or in the legal community. And these are our four main areas that I just mentioned. I love to um, state our mission, which is to promote well-being and resilience in the legal community, improve lives, nurture confidence, and elevate the standing of the legal profession. So as you can see, it's quite expansive, okay? Um, so my area, is, as I said, is law practice management. And so in the area of law practice management and ethics, we have a variety of resources and offerings. Um, if you go on our website, you can browse by topics. I'll discuss those topics in a minute. But there are, are multiple resources available on demand. We have articles. We have startup kits. We have lots of helpful resources. This is an example of every month we have a webinar for busy lawyers, usually on Wednesdays. Um, this is a recent one on marketing tech mindset. But we run them, as I say, every month. And they're terrific. And they're short, kind of a short um take on a given area jeff sorry i have to ask jeff to move the slides we couldn't get them to run automatically um, so this is an example of our law practice startup uh, services so this is a workshop and a guide so it offers an on-demand workshop that's a two-hour workshop you can start and stop it that goes over all the basics insurance location and space selection uh, entity selection time, billing, IOLTA, and so forth. And there's also a very helpful guide that um, you know, answers the basic you know, frequently asked questions and also gives tips and resources on all of the main areas of starting a practice. We find that you know, lawyers study law, but they don't study business. So there's a lot of areas in which uh, lawyers need help and we're here to provide it. Jeff? So this is an example. This is our, um, our blog. And as you can see, it just lists again of some of the resources we have. Here's a job search 101 for lawyers. That's a presentation that our friend Amy gave our colleague, Amy Levine gave recently. And those are also collected in the library online. We have a, um, another webinar on the benefits of mediation strategy to better serve clients. We have a, a whole library of webinars and articles, et cetera. And you can online schedule a free and confidential converse, uh, consultation. And I will say here, uh, you can note the category that you think you need assistance with. 
Um, we look at our intake forms, they're being condensed and made a little bit more user friendly. But we look at them and try and decide who can best help you. And we also offer joint consultations. So there are times that Jeff and I might do a joint consultation for a client that's experiencing anxiety and is also struggling with managing client, fi you know, client files, excuse me, or client communication, et cetera. There's a lot of overlap in actually all of our services. So we do have the benefit of doing joint consultations. Okay, Jeff. Uh, so here's a variety of the topics we cover in law practice management. And actually, uh, it's really, I just want to emphasize how important it is that you know that we have these services because most, you know, oftentimes, at least in my practice, there were many, many times I could have used a a one-on-one -on -one consult or some help in these areas. So there's, you know, everything from marketing and business development, um, you know, productivity, opening and closing a practice, staffing, law practice management systems. These are becoming, you know, increasingly in a paperless world. It's becoming more and more important to have a law practice management systems in place that will organize materials into files uh, from any source, whether you write an email to a client or do a correspondence or pleadings, they get organized into a file in a systematic manner and they're easily accessible, not only to the lawyer who's working on the file, but to any other lawyer in the firm or organization. So there's just um, a variety of topics that we work with with clients. Jeff? So you're also going to find in our connect.lclama.org, uh, connect our online site, you'll find a calendar of upcoming events. So you can always go on. And I went on this week to look at, uh, we, we talk about the group meetings we offer. So there was a solo stress connection this week in conjunction with um, well-being in the law week. There was a mindfulness meditation on Monday. Those are live events that are listed on our calendar and you can access easily. There are the 30 minute webinars for the busy lawyer I mentioned recently. And then there are uh, a whole library of webinars on the various topics I just mentioned. And this week when I went on, the job search uh, webinar was, was noted, okay? Okay, ethics. So this is the other really huge area that law practice management advisors deal with. And ethics concern the Massachusetts Rules of Court, in particular Rule 307, which are, contains the rules of professional conduct. So uh, I've got three slides on this because there are so many ethical issues that lawyers address and deal with. And I'm just going to stop for a minute on this. So, you know, there are individual rules on things like fee agreements, disengagement letters, IOLTA accounts, communications, et cetera. But, um, you know, I always like to say that the ethical rules are certainly for clients. The, the goal is to protect clients from being harmed by lawyers. You know, our goal is really to help them and help solve our system in solving problems. But there are also rules that really help lawyers. So for example, fee agreements and disengagement letters are really important to set the parameters of the, of the representation to explain what you're, what you're managing, what you're handling for the client and what you're not representing them on, the costs that you incur along the way that will be handed on to the client, client or the fees, how they're calculated, how they're billed, et cetera. And we're finding increasingly disengagement letters are important. We have, uh, I particularly had a case recently in the immigration field where often clients change lawyers, but there was a lawyer who had not um, clearly disengaged from representation and a dis uh, actually a uh, deportment hearing came up and uh, uh, the, uh, the client mistakenly thought the lawyer was still representing them. So you really can, what we look to do in the ethical rules, I think what we're really guided to do is be, be clear about what we're doing and what our practice is. So Jeff, you can go on to the next. Um, I just wanna say conflict of interest was on the last slide. Oftentimes, you know, it's you may have a question, you may not know. I mean, we do conflict checks, but a, a situation may arise in the course of representing someone, and you're just not sure whether it's a conflict or not, or what the what there seems to be something problematic, and you can't quite identify it or know how to work your way out of it. So that's part of our individual consultations. We talk through the rules, we go through them with you, 
we look at the comments and um, try and assist you. The rules constantly cross-reference themselves. So we try and also sort of help you put them together. So these are things on declining or terminating representation, duties to clients, even prospective clients, uh, when you're selling your practice, our roles as both an advisor and an advocate. Jeff, I think this is my last ethics one, but you can see sort of these are issues partially surrounding, you know, surrounding litigation, our, our job to expedite litigation and be, uh, you know, completely honest before a tribunal, fair to opposing party and counsel, uh, you know, present, you know, uh, rules about trial publicity, rules about lawyers being witnesses. So there's just a whole lot of information. And I, my favorite book is always the Massachusetts Rules of Court, which, um, actually contain all of these rules, but as I say, we help you walk through them, uh, find the right comments that pertain to your situation and, and look, you know, connect the ones that are also pertinent. Okay, Jeff. Um, so practice management, this is about individual consultations, which I talked about. So first of all, the most important thing you need to know is that they're confidential. Everything we do at LCL is completely confidential. We don't report to the BBO. We're not connected to the BBO. Uh, when you come to us, we treat you according to the rules. You are our clients. So as a lawyer, you are as if you are my client and I am bound not to disclose any confidences that we discuss. Um, and of course, our clinic, clinical team is bound by, are bound by their own rules of, of conduct and their rules of confidentiality. Um, our services are also free. I like to always say that. They're, you've paid for them by a very small portion of your bar dues. So upon entering practice, you become an automatic uh, beneficiary of LCL and any services that we can do to help you. So you can go in and choose your services. You, can, um, you may have someone in particular that you want to see. You may have worked with someone in the past or heard about someone. So you can do that. Um, and again, we do do um, joint consultations or collaborative, and we collaborate, but oftentimes, uh, if you're unsure, we would put you with one of our clinicians first to help identify sort of what would be most helpful and how we can put together a team to work with you. So you can book services, you can go on, and um, once you do our intake form, Typically what happens is you will get a um, response from our office manager. She will give you a link so that you can go into our either individual or joint calendars and find a time that's convenient for you. We, um, so we do uh, most of our consults we've been doing online, although we do have an office in Boston on 31 Middle Street and we do meet with clients in person as well. Okay, Jeff. So these are some of the things that Law practice management services is some sort of a uh, few boundaries around it. What we can't do is we cannot offer legal advice. So we can't um, do that. We're not consulting lawyers. We're not part, we're not, that's not something that we do. So we don't discuss case strategy or any of that, or even choices you're making as an individual practitioner. Uh, we can't make and implement decisions we have for you. So oftentimes you will recommend a variety of steps or strategies to help with what you're grappling with. And it's really up to the individual lawyer that's seeking help to implement those strategies. Um, and we don't do extensive hands-on or you know work projects or we're not, we don't do, you know, we're not an IT person, we don't do projects, we don't manage projects for lawyers. But what we do do is we offer consultation and guidance. We try and shine a light on whatever obstacles uh, you may be coming up against uh, that you have to watch out for and various resources that you could heed in assisting you with your practice. We also help you identify pain points. So we put a name on the problems you're facing. We try and point you to relevant resources. So we talk through things with you and try and see where you're getting stuck, see what's um, preventing you from, that's blocking your, the management of your practice that's causing you difficulties. Okay, Jeff. Addiction and recovery is my next topic. And as um, Jeff already said, it was just a wonderful um, seminar last night put on by the Lawyer, Lawyer Committee on Wellbeing on uh, recovering out loud. So let me say that in recovery service, alcohol use disorder 
is considered, a, it is a disease, it's chronic, it's progressive, and ultimately it's fatal. Uh, in recovery circles, we talk about um, alcoholism as a threefold illness. So the, there's a component of physical craving so that someone with alcohol use disorder, when they take a drink, the drink wants another drink, the drink wants another drink, and ultimately the drink takes the person. So there's a phenomenon of physical craving that gets set up when alcohol, for example, I've been in recovery for 20 years. So it, when alcohol goes into my system, uh, this whole phenomenon of craving takes over, um, which makes it impossible really to control the amount uh, that you consume. So, I mean, I, I will say that, I'll go back to that, but there's also a mental obsession, which means you're constantly thinking about drinking, thinking about not drinking, thinking about when you're gonna drink, thinking about whether there's gonna be enough for you to drink. And ultimately there's a spiritual loss of values. And by, by that, I mean that the addictive substance becomes so uh, prominent in your life that other your, the values that you really, uh, the people you love, the things that you care about, the way you would conduct yourself in an ordinary uh, state get push, pushed aside. And so you do things that you would never do under ordinary circumstances. And again, I want to really point out, it's not that you're a bad person, it's that you're a sick person trying to get better. And that's what we're trying to do in helping you. So we can go, Jeff, to the next slide. So I want to talk about LCL support group meetings. The wonderful thing about LCL support group meetings is that they're for lawyers. So you're working with other professionals in your field, sometimes students in the field. And so you can really share uh, in a really in-depth and honest and intimate way about how you're struggling with the issue of alcoholism in your life, what's going on in your life, what's going on in your practice. And various you know, people share their own experience, strength and hope, what happened to them, how they started on the journey of recovery and things that have happened to turn their lives around along the way. There's wonderful connection and fellowship among all of us who are members of the LCL, LCL recovery community. We offer tools to help you stay on a sober path, phone numbers to call, um, you know, various resources that are available. And one of the most wonderful things is that we help one another. We really form a tight, team of people who really care about one another and we can call one another at any time. And we show up for one another and we help one another deal with um, stresses that uh, challenge our sobriety. And we also have sponsorship. So I know many lawyers who have found a sponsor in the wounds of LCL support group meetings where they um, help one another, where they walk one another through, or where a sponsor helps someone walk through uh, the steps of recovery. And so it's a wonderful place to meet people. And I have lifelong friends that have I've met at uh, LCL support group meetings. Jeff? So our recovery services, I just wanted to summarize some of the meetings that we have. We have weekly meetings three days a week. Um, Two of them are online. One is a hybrid meeting. All of those, the first three I was mentioning on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Uh, the Tuesday and Thursday, it's from one to two. Uh, Wednesday is a shorter one. It's a 45 minute meeting that ends at 1.45. So the first two are online. And um, the Thursday meeting is now hybrid. So we have people that come into the LCL office and we have a new fancy DNC uh, system where we can, um, have people come in from online and we can all see one another and we can conduct a meeting that way. Um, there are some satellite meetings right now. There's uh, one in Springfield, in North Andover, in Newburyport. Those are usually monthly. Um, all of these are on our website, but those are all in person and they're monthly. And we are more than happy, willing, and, uh, and able to help you start a meeting if you're interested in starting a meeting in your own area an LCL support group meeting. And we have people who have started them so they can help you out. We just have recovery day, which is a, a day long program of panels and discussions about various topics related to sobriety, including things like anonymity and um, all, all sorts of topics we talked about. It was a very wonderful group of panelists and wonderful discussion. And we also have a lot of opportunities for volunteers in, the recover, in our recovery 
uh, services area. So we want to be doing more going out and speaking to bar associations, speaking to law schools. We like people to commit to being at meetings so we know that there will be people there if a newcomer comes on board. As I say, there's opportunities for sponsorship. We also have a monitoring program where sometimes we, someone um, in a law firm is concerned about one of their partners or associates. And so they refer them to us and we enter a monitoring agreement, which provides that we offer support to the person who's getting, beginning the, the journey of recovery. So we attend sporadic, you know, sporadic meetings with them and we help them find meetings and we uh, enter an agreement that will sort of ensure that they're getting help and moving along on their recovery, their own recovery path. Okay. So the main point I think Jeff and I are both trying to make today is that we're here to help. You know, it is hard for lawyers to ask for help. There's, we're really trained to be smart and competent and use our intellect and our analytical skills to work through things. And it's much more difficult for us to acknowledge our vulnerability and to reach out and ask for help. One thing I want to mention about the, the recent NORC study, what they did find, while the, the numbers that were able to reach out and ask for help were very small, the people who did ask for help inevitably got help. And I think that's really what we want you to know. Uh, again, we're trying to promote well-being and resilience, improve lives, nurture confidence. I want to again emphasize we're a separate nonprofit organization under the auspices of the SJC, but there's no there's no reporting, there's no direct connection with uh, what, you know the BBO. Our services are confidential, and we really want to. Another thing I really want to emphasize, it's joyful for us to provide preventative care and assistance to lawyers. We sometimes, I've worked with lawyers on more than one occasion. They've worked on one issue and they've come back on another. So we really are here to sort of help one another, help our the lawyers in Massachusetts have successful and happy and healthy practices. So that's what we're really all about. I like to say we want to help restore I always say life work balance because I think the life part is really the most important to your family and your uh, all of the various things you care about outside of work so that you can balance it and have a healthy life overall uh, while maintaining a successful and productive law practice. So that's the conclusion of my, I think, presentation. And I have just a, a little a quick little bit about uh, the clinical services. Uh, yeah. So uh, when, when someone comes to us uh, to see one of our four clinicians, uh, among the services we offer are individual evaluation of any of these kinds of issues, not only those that met the di diagnostic criteria I described before, but also all kinds of stresses, relationship issues, helping you understand your situation and your options. We do both short-term consultation and follow-up sessions as indicated, and we assist with further referrals, which has become much more challenging in recent years with the greater demand and the reduced comparative supply of therapists, but we, we try to help with that. We also offer uh, support and discussion groups that, that we run that are separate from the peer support groups. Those are mostly virtual. Of course, we have various online offerings. And again, our services are free and confidential. And we uh, the, the so-called snitch rule does not apply to anything that happens at LCL. These are the four uh, of us ex exceptionally good looking clinicians. And these are some of the groups that we offer. Uh, you can just scan those. The, the two that I uh, run are one for immigration lawyers and uh, actually two different ones for solo practitioners. And in addition to these active groups, at, at sometimes we have groups for law students and for job search. And we thank you and that concludes the presentation. Thank you so much, Jeff and Jane and uh, the other Jeff.
Um, just to quickly introduce myself, I'm Amy Levine. I am the program and volunteer administrator here. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to say we are open now for questions and answers. We have a, a few minutes. If you do have any questions, um, feel free to use the chat, feel free to use the Q&A part. Um, while we're waiting to see if anybody does have any questions, I'm wondering, uh, Jeff and Jane, um, I know Jeff, you mentioned the uh, support groups that we offer. Um, is there anything that you can tell us a little bit more in detail about some of these groups and maybe some of the, um, like the ADH group or something like that and um, what's typically talked about potentially? Well, the ADHD group is run by Sean Healy, my colleague, so I'm I'm not there for that. What I, I certainly did become aware early in my uh, years at LCL that lawyers were no less uh, likely to have ADHD than anyone else. I, I don't think they're any more likely to have it either, but um, it does pose certain kinds of, of difficulties. Uh, for example, uh, I remember seeing people who talked about copying over documents and leaving the wrong client's name on them, uh, lawyers who have trouble prioritizing uh, their tasks and getting to the more time pressure tasks first, et cetera. And there are you know, strategies for, for dealing with those kinds of things. Um, and, and there also are, uh, when you have ADHD, it can be helpful to have the right kind of assistance to people to delegate some things to that are not your strong suit. And it also turns out that there are certain types of law that people with ADHD are really better at than most people. Because as you may know, people with ADHD by and large um, are, are better at thinking outside the box and being creative and also better at um, dealing with things uh, right in the moment. So, uh, for example, when ADA is uh, you know, handed a file and five minutes later, they're going to be speaking about it uh, in court, uh, people with ADHD tend to be very good at that. But at, on the other hand, they tend to have more difficulty keeping the records straight later on. So uh, in, in Sean's group for ADHD lawyers, which is well attended and, uh, and meets I think every week, um, uh, the people compare strategies for, for coping. Uh, in my groups for solo practitioners, we deal with you know, the, the life of the solo practitioner, which is a more isolated one, and the group provides the kind of comparing notes with other people that someone would have if, if they're in a setting that places them around colleagues much more often. And people deal with, you know, people in solo practice have to do their own billing. Some people have more problems with that than others. They have to do their own marketing. Um, and uh, they, they have to figure out what to do with cases without having as many colleagues available to check with. So in those groups, I'm really the facilitator and the action occurs among and between those in attendance on Zoom. Uh, and um, in the immigration lawyers group that I do, you know, that's, I think for obvious reasons, that's, it's a very, very stressful kind of law to practice, not, not a very financially rewarding one. Um, and um, uh, one knows that most cases will be lost, especially asylum cases, et cetera. And there, there's a lot to cope with there. So people support one another. And they try to they help each other keep up with the week to week changes and the rules and the, the way that that's all organized. And uh, so I, I think with both of those uh, groups, it, it, uh, my role is merely to facilitate and what people really get out of it is from one another. Excellent, excellent. We do have a question. Um, and uh, first of all, this person says, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, I echo that. Uh, while Jane was presenting, this person was doing their best to investigate the Maslow Map website along with her 
um, and found that some of the links led to a page not found message. Are there resources available through other means? Example, practices and procedures manual by the ABA. Okay, so uh, thanks for the question. Um, I'm sorry to hear that there was a snag with our website. Typically, you should try both, but I would start with uh, lclma.org. Now, if you're looking for a resource that's, for example, uh, you know, a, a sort of library resource or an ABA resource, those aren't located there. But if you have trouble finding them, you can call us and we can try and direct you in the right to the right place. Um, the Social Law Library is a wonderful resource for sort of generally materials that are helpful to lawyers. Um, and there are certainly webinars and presentations that go on by the bar associations, by the mass bar association, by the American bar association. So our lawyers are, excuse me, our webinars, our material is primarily geared to what we're trying to do, which is to sort of help lawyers with managing their practice, help lawyers with any clinical issues that come up, help lawyers sometimes identify what's happening. I mean, I do wanna say, you don't have to know, if you think you need help, you can call us. You're not responsible for identifying exactly what you think the issue is we can help you sort through um, what's going on and who and how we might be able to, to give you assistance. So I wanted to say that. And the other thing I wanted to say about recovery is that, you know, the only you, if you have any interest in stopping drinking uh, or taking a look at what's happening with your, any substance use, you can get in touch with us and you, you can both call us and you can come to one of our meetings. We're readily, uh, accessible and happy to talk to you about those things. Yeah, I, I would throw in, uh, have, uh, feel very free to contact any member of our staff through a call or email, uh, including if something isn't working on the website or you're looking for a resource that you can't find. Uh, it, it happens that we're in the process of reorganizing our websites and the, the separate low map site is going to be faded out and become more integrated with the LCL website, which is being revamped. So part of what you're running into with those links may be a function of those changes underway. I'll also say that sort of we're developing, we're growing and developing as an organization all the time. So we're considering, for example, coaching services, other services that might be useful to lawyers. So if you have thoughts, if you have suggestions, if you have ideas about what would be helpful for you, please also feel free to get in touch with us and let us know. Or if you'd like us to come to anything, any other sort of activity that you think would be helpful to hear about LCL services, we'd be happy to come. And I, I do want to add that um, if you, when you do contact us, if you do contact us, uh, you can reach out uh, anonymously. So when you fill out one of the forms online, or if you call us and you're not feel, you don't feel comfortable. Um, letting us know your name or anything like that. So again, it is confidential and um, we'd rather you reach out to us um, rather than not. And so if you feel more comfortable doing it that way, that would be great. Um, we do have just a couple more minutes left. Um, I wanted to find out, uh, I guess, again, if you can do this quickly, um, can you talk a little bit more about um, our diversion slash monitoring program? I know, again, we have very limited time, but I'm wondering um, if that's something that people might be interested in hearing about. Sure, there are two separate programs. So the diversion program is a program where sometimes people are contacted by the BBO and there's an investigation done and there's a determination by the uh, Office of Bar Council, which is the prosecutorial arm of the BBO, that um, they want to give someone the opportunity to obtain services. They want to, uh, it may be that there's, um, there has been a hearing and there's a decision to uh, stay a suspension, so that they give a, a time period where someone could uh, uh, provide, you know, obtain services and improve their practice, their situation. So we do get referrals from the BBO, and sometimes people, we and we also run a group for people who are involved in the disciplinary process so they can talk about the stresses related to that and the issues that come up in the course of um, working in the BBO system. But we have many uh, cases where, there, where lawyers 
they want to divert the lawyers from formal discipline. And so we come in handy in helping lawyers sort of really sit down and look where they've gone, you know, confidentially, look where they think they've gone off track, uh, help them with ways to get back on track, help them with ways to uh, improve their practice, demonstrate that they've made steps and have made improvements. So that's one of the functions we have. Again, you don't have to be contacted by the BBO if you think you need some assistance with your practice or if you're concerned, if you're concerned that you're you know, bumping along some ethical line or rule or something has happened in your practice that you're worried about, please call us. You know, As I said, we are not connected to the BDO, we're confidential and we will walk you through it. We will go through the rules with you. We will talk about the situation with you and we really would, will help, you know, try and help you. Um, so we do get cases, as I say, we do get some referrals. Uh, Clients are referred to us. And again, we could never contact the BDO without a specific um, you know, uh, request and release from a client. That just, that really doesn't happen. So anyway, we're here on either end. And monitoring very quickly is a separate system, mostly uh, relating to alcohol and sometimes drug issues in which we help people document that they're doing everything that would be consistent for recovery, typically in order to show something to a third party, such as the CPCS, a law firm, BBO, and that includes uh, making sure that they're in the right kind of treatment, that they're attending self-help meetings. It includes alcohol and drug testing and various other things. But we view that not as something that we're ever imposing on anyone. We do it upon request, by the lawyer who wants to document this. Excellent, excellent. Well, well I see that also, I just want to say, I see that also, um, it really is sort of an attempt to be preventative. In other words, and to really help someone that needs more assistance, more hands-on help in the process of recovery. So we do it and the, the both the lawyer who's the person who's looking for help and the lawyer who serves as the uh, monitor Enter an agreement, so it's very clear, sort of what the what they're looking at, what they're agreeing to do, and how the monitor is there to help the lawyer in need. Excellent. Well, we are just at our time limit, so I want to say thank you to everyone, uh, Jeff Spofford, also for hosting this, allowing us to uh, be a part of the Wellbeing in Law Week. And um, the recording should be on both of the website for LCL as well as the Worcester County Bar Association. So if you missed a part of it or you know you have a friend who's interested who couldn't make it, uh, it will be available on both sites. And again, thank you so much to everyone for attending and hopefully it was helpful. And um, again, we appreciate it. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Amy. Thank All you. Right. On behalf of the Worcester County Bar Association, thank you, Jeff and Jane, as well. We really appreciate it. All right. Excellent.